One of the goals of the space station is to help prepare humankind for future exploration out into the solar system, as well as to Mars and, uh, or including to Mars and other destinations. Uh, through it, we've already learned that some of the crew members who have been in a weightless environment for a long period of time come home with diminished vision. An experiment called Ocular Health is underway to find out why, and the recent conclusion of Expedition 47 marked the end of its on-orbit data gathering. Recently, my colleague Pat Ryan talked with the principal investigator of the experiment, Dr. Christian Otto, to find out where they stand, and he started by asking Otto to characterize the vision changes that have been noticed in astronauts after shuttle flights and after six months on the space station mission. Yeah, well, that's a really interesting question, Pat, and it really goes back many years. In fact, uh, in shuttle, it was noticed that crew members had changes in their vision, and, and they were often prescribed uh, glasses, uh, space anticipation glasses that they could wear in flight as that vision changed. And this was also noted in the ISS era to a greater degree. So there was this change in vision. We think that has to do with changes in the structural nature of the eye. We also know from uh, shuttle flights that there was a change in the intraocular pressure, usually early in flight in the first seven to 10 days, and that tended, tended to normalize. But it wasn't until the mid 2000s, 2005, that a crew member returned with swelling of the optic disc. We call that disc edema, and in uh, critical care emergency medicine, papal edema if it's caused by raised intracranial pressure. So this appeared a bit uh, strange at the time, and then a second and then a third crew member returned with disc edema, and space medicine knew that they were dealing with something here that was uh, uh, concerning, and why are we getting crew members returning with optic disc edema? And there are many causes of optic disc edema, uh, and investigations with those initial crew members uh, determined that there were some structural changes with the eyes. And, over the past several years, it's been clear there's a constellation of signs and symptoms that uh, has been formalized into the visual impairment intracranial pressure risk. And so this is a risk that's been stood up by NASA. And the ocular health experiment is the first onboard experiment in the VIP portfolio. Symptoms such as? So clearly the one you've mentioned is a change in vision. Typically, uh, near vision would degrade. and far vision would remain intact or even get better. We see changes in the shape of the globe. It gets somewhat compressed. The optic nerve that runs from the brain to the eye is surrounded in a sheath and has cerebral spinal fluid within that sheath around the optic nerve. And if intracranial pressure goes up, that sheath diameter can, can increase, suggestive of elevated pressure. And we've seen significant changes uh, in that parameter as well. Uh, and the, the disc edema in 2012, a, an ocular coherence tomography machine, which is a sophisticated device used in ophthalmology and optometry to look at how much swelling occurs uh, in the retina, was launched to the space station. It's a significant capability on space station now. And we were able to measure to the micron level changes in this disc edema. And clearly, the crew members there are different severities. We have individuals who reach uh, clinical significance, if you will, uh, with clinical grade disc edema, and then there are others who uh, either don't get very much swelling or have a very mild amount of, of, of swelling. Do any of them improve spontaneously once they come back to work? Yeah, so in the ocular health experiment, we've been able to, again, we're getting this categorization of subjects. In 10 subjects that we've tested so far, one has become a clinical, is a clinical VIP case, so they have the edema to the point that uh, it's clinically concerning. All the others would be considered non-cases. Um, some of those, again, are subclinical, but they're not clinical cases. And what we're seeing is certainly in the case, these symptoms are persisting, not all of them, but many of the symptoms are persisting uh, through one year post-flight, and that's the length of time that the ocular health study is testing individuals. We test five times post-flight. Uh, as soon as a crew member returns, flight day 30, 90, 180, and then 365. Um, and in other individuals, the non-cases, we see the symptoms abate uh, rapidly and uh, without consequence. When you're first considering this, what sort of, of were the options about what may be causing the problem? Mm -hmm. 
So initially, a lot of the work done in the space program has clearly shown that fluid shift is a, is a major change that occurs in the physiological system. One to two liters of fluid tends to move from the lower limbs uh, towards the head into the thorax and the chest, etc. So that really was one of the first hypotheses, the primary hypothesis, that this may be causing some changes in the, the pressure in the head. Clearly in weightlessness, there's no acceleration due to gravity. We do think that there may be some congestion of blood in, in the head and in the brain because we don't have that assistance due to gravity like we have here on Earth helping to drain the venous blood uh, from the brain. And there's other uh, many other hypotheses that we're still investigating. Um, there may be uh, an underlying genetic propensity. Um, the uh, changes in the one carbon pathway that Dr. Smith is investigating. Uh, we've identified that crew members who have an elevated cardiovascular risk seem to be more susceptible to the VIP syndrome. We think that may be due to the elasticity or what we call the compliance of the blood vessels and the ability mm -hmm. to accommodate that fluid shift. So if your vessels are stiffer, you'll move more of that uh, fluid towards uh, the head. A couple of minutes ago, you mentioned a couple of different ways that you were uh, getting data from the crew on orbit, different kinds of examinations. I, I'm guessing that that relates to the several different possible causes that you were just talking about as well. Yeah, Pat, this is an incredibly complex problem um, that involves the, the ocular system itself is incredibly complex. So we need to understand the changes that are happening in the structure, structural anatomy. We have to understand the functional changes. So we use ocular ultrasound to understand what's going on behind the eye. I mentioned the optic nerve sheath and changes with intracranial pressure. Uh, there's the globe of the eye, if you will, uh, appears to be compressed. We're measuring how much compression that occurs in each individual, so we use ocular ultrasound for that. We want to know what's happening with the pressure inside the eye, intraocular pressure, which is very important, for example, in glaucoma patients. We don't want the pressure to be too high or too low. It appears with most of the crew members on station, it's staying nominal, very, uh, very comparable to pre-flight. I mentioned the OCT device on station, so we can uh, determine what's happening with the optic disc edema. Uh, we're also using uh, ocular ultrasound to look at blood flow in the eye. Is, are the, is the blood flow being altered and changing pressures? And we're also looking at other aspects of, in other systems that may be interacting with the ocular system. So for example, we're using transcranial Doppler to look at changes in blood flow in the brain. Can that give us an indication of what's happening to intracranial pressure? Because it's that pressure that may be changing uh, the pressures behind the eye. Do you do the same sort of examinations with the crew members after they come home too? You, you mentioned that you're gonna do tests maybe out to a year. Are you doing all of these different kinds of tests over that time? Yeah, we are. And so it's really important to understand what is happening to the crew member pre-flight, what are the changes in flight, but how are they recovering post-flight? And so that was one of the designs of the Ocular Health Experiment, to follow the crew member for that one year post-flight. Um, so over the entire duration of the experiment, it's a three-year commitment for, for the, the subjects. And so we are following them with all of the tests. And in fact, we add some tests that can't be done in, in, on the ISS. For example, uh, we do the MRI magnetic resonance imaging in the brain pre-flight and also five times post-flight. And what we're trying to characterize is the recovery. How fast is the recovery in crew members? Is it complete at one year? Um, and uh, for example, is it not complete? And in the cases, uh, what is the recovery pattern for those individuals? And this information will help us understand the interrelationships of the different systems, not just the ocular system, but potentially the cardiovascular and the central nervous system, but help us understand what the roles are of each of these in, in precipitating what we're seeing with the ocular changes and ultimately uh, help us uh, design countermeasures to prevent uh, the VIP syndrome from occurring. Good luck with the analysis. We'll wait to hear what happens. Thanks very much. It's great to be with you. Dr. Christianato is the principal investigator of the ocular health experiment that's been run on subjects on board the International Space Station.